Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Expedition. My name's David Greenwood, and I'm your host for today. Let me start by asking you a question. Would you cross the Southern Ocean during its iciest year on record, making a stop in Antarctica on a sailing boat infested with termites and a crew with limited sailing experience? Nico Edwards would. Here he is to tell us more. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Where are you dialing in from today? I am in uh, Colorado in the middle of the United States right now. Been on a bit of a road trip doing some backpacking in Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. Um, right. So, so we're yeah. speaking today at the end of September. So I guess the weather's starting to turn a bit there at the moment, the backpacking season coming to an end. Yes, uh, and the global climate change thing hit here a little harder. Strange, freaky weather. In early September, we had like eight inches of snow. Oh, really? Which is wow. rather unusual. The trees are starting to break because they still have leaves on. They're not prepared for snow this early. So, um, but I'm just going to keep uh, keep persevering into the cold because I have nothing better to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> but we're here today to talk about a journey that didn't take place on land at all. And we're going to talk about your film that you shot in 2014 called Sea Gypsies. Yeah, the uh, Sea Gypsies, The Far Side of the World is kind of an, an ode to the Master and Commander series, which is one of the most superb sailing films ever made and books, uh, book series, if, if people are into that kind of thing. Um, I, so this is just, this was an expedition from new kind of New Zealand to Patagonia with a short stop off in Antarctica uh, on a 50 year old cement uh, hand built gypsy boat um, with a, 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 a gaggle of crew that uh, the, you know experience levels vary um, definitely an expedition for the non elite is kind of how I sort of term it it's the everyday man you know it's like we're mostly like electricians and uh, plumbers and just regular folks who wanted to go to the place we're not supposed to go. How do you fall into an adventure like that? Do you have seagoing experience yourself or you a sailor before getting into it? Uh, not, not exactly. I, I grew up on a houseboat, uh, so I've always really liked the feel of the water and being on the water. Oh, cool. Where about? Um, in the San Francisco Bay. It's oh, this beautiful. little town across from San Francisco, uh, and there was a bunch of houseboats there, and the whole community in the 60s and 70s that started up, and it was, uh, they call it the last free ride, and you could just get some styrofoam and uh, plywood and sleep on it and build out from that, and it was totally free, and people could just kind of live there, this very alternative, out-of-the-box existence, not paying rent, not being part of society in the, quite the same sort of way. And I kind of fell into the, the charm of that, I guess. It's a, it's a way of life that doesn't really exist many places anymore. Mm. And so I've always been attracted to the ocean and getting far, far away. It's the last part of the world that's just the only part of the world that's just not owned by anybody. I guess Antarctica is kind of like that, but it's comp pretty inhospitable and you're technically not allowed to just go there. Um, so I sought that out and I found this boat, Infinity, uh, kind of on the classifieds uh, on the internet um, <clears throat> a couple years prior and it had all these kind of slick ads and I, I figured, oh, okay, it's like slick pictures, made it look really professional. I didn't think I'd be on it very long because that wasn't quite my vibe. But when mm. I got on it, it was just an absolute mess of a thing. It's a, a wild, crazy man and his feral children and living on this thing and I mean the reviews online were just like scattered with like oh people are just horrified by what they find on there <laughs> and uh I thought it was perfect now Captain Clem he is quite a character right you've touched on it briefly but could you describe this guy for those listening yeah he's uh one of definitely one of the more interesting people I've run across in life um he is a, a very eccentric character. Ran away from home at the age of 14 
um, lived on a recombinant bicycle. He's from Germany originally, some small town in Germany. And uh, yeah, he lived on a bicycle uh, in Eastern Europe for a couple of years when he was like 14, 15, 16. Traded that in for a camel, lived in Libya and the Sinai Peninsula on this camel for a year, mostly around this little oasis he found in the desert. And, and then eventually kind of wanted something bigger and then started his like trading up process for sailboats. And he just has this force of personality. He gets a little too close to you and talks about his dream and you get a little too into the dream and the realities of life and if it's possible, just sort of fade away and you kind of buy into whatever he's saying. And he's been able to trade. Yeah, he started with a, a small boat, convinced somebody on a bus to loan him $5,000 <laughs> at the age of 17. And then he's just kind of been trading up and up and up. And he found infinity in a junkyard in uh, San Diego and in, in the early, I think it was the 90s, the early 90s in the Gulf War was starting and all these giant aircraft carriers were around San Diego. And it was just a total wreck, just this cement. It had holes in it and some guy was living on it and he got it for next to nothing and just took it to Mexico and built it up. And he's just been working on the thing ever since. And the idea of making a space big enough to actually have like a community, mm. not big enough for more than just his children, because he kind of realized that, you know, he could have his children on there, but he wanted his children to be exposed to other people and other viewpoints in the world. And so he wanted a, a real like a uh, water world sort of floating community thing. Mm. And uh, he's been able to create it, but it hasn't been easy. On the other side of it, there was, as you described in all of the copy around the film, a crew of miscreants. Um, Infinity is like a, it's a big red magnet for the weirdos of the world. I've kind of found some of the most interesting people, people who are willing to drop whatever they're doing in life for six months to a year and just go and trust their lives to this lunatic on the ocean and <laughs> and live this life that where the the plan is to have no plan i think most people want to know what they're going to do in the next month they're going to want to mm. do with the next day and you get on this boat and you have no concept or clue what you're going to do in the next year and not a lot of people are willing to do that so it attracts a very specific kind of type of person but these people all are kind of driven in their own way and and everybody on the boat for the most part that i found has as a really interesting skill sets. You described the trip as not being a cruise earlier. And l looking through the film and all of the shots, you can see that it definitely wasn't a cruise. And the makeup of the team was incredibly important in making sure the ship stayed seaworthy, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, that was actually the entire premise originally. I mean, going to Antarctica and doing a Pacific crossing for the thrill of it was part of it. But when I originally got on the boat. Um, I had told Clemens, you know, if you ever have a giant adventure, let me know and I'll come back. And I went back and tried to learn how to make videos and stuff. And then he called me just out of the blue on like a, it was like a Saturday night or something. And he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm just, you know, learning video, da, 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 filling him in on my life. And he's like, well, uh, so the boat is just riddled with these tropical termites and I've tried absolutely everything all these poisons that are not even legal in the first world anymore and anything you could possibly think of to get rid of these things and there's at least seven or eight different species on the boat just destroying it and wow. he had talked to some ancient salty dog in some port who told him that if he could get the boat below freezing for 72 hours it would kill all the termites and their eggs and everything so that was his I, he's like so I'm going to Antarctica to kill the termites, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I want to go. When are, when are you going? And he's like, Tuesday. <laughs> and so I had about a week to kind of sell all my stuff and buy everything I needed and meet him in Micronesia. And that's where that kind of started. And yeah, the boat, um, there's elements of it. On a superficial level, it is completely rotting away and mm -hmm. there are some serious issues, but the core of it, it's, it's, we think it's the largest ferro cement yacht ever built. And ferro cement is just incredibly tough. It takes 50 years for it to reach its maximum strength from when it's made. And oh, you know, wow. it was laid, the, the cement was laid in the 70s. So she's just getting in her kind of in her prime. Um, 
but that said, it's like you just never know with a ferro cement boat how it's doing because you can't see inside of the concrete. And it's held together by a, a web of chicken wire. And if the chicken wire rusts too much, it just sort of falls out. Um, so there were definitely times on that expedition, you know, we hit some huge pieces of ice mm. and, and you just, yeah, you have no clue what's going on. And in the end, like after the expedition, you know, the mast fell down. We were really lucky we weren't in Antarctica when that happened, but the stresses of the cold at night and the sun in the, in the day just, just really had a big impact on the metal of the, the stanchions, the supporting rods for the mast. And, and when they were just crossing the Pacific on the way back, the whole thing fell down on a light breeze. And Clemens just jumped in the water with his scuba gear and pulled it all up back on the boat and welded it back on. So, I mean, the guy's insane. As if but, nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, it took a lot. He had to bring it to the Philippines and, you know, it, and then it fell down again. <laughs> and he had to put it back up. And it's masts are extremely expensive. He spent $100,000 on a wow. mast big enough for a 120-foot boat. Um, so he doesn't have that kind of money. So everything that happens on that boat is made by him. We call them like clembentions because there's all these finicky little strange inventions on the boat that keep the world going. And they're kind of, they're all kind of made by him. He's got a water maker on there that turns the salt water, the ocean water into fresh water. And it's compiled by from six or seven desalinators that he got on. He, he has a theory he'll buy eight broken ones and the belief that if he combines all of them that they broke in different ways and i'll have at least one working one ingenious you mentioned briefly there about the icebergs you were having to face now it came across very very well the the danger you were facing in the film but it must have been 10 times scarier actually being there were you quite fearful I wouldn't say fear. It's uh, you understand very well in the moment that there's a very high chance that you might not survive the night. We were stuck in a, a force 12. I think it was uh, like a hurricane basically of ice in the Ross sea. Um, and we rode that for three days and we had an engine that was absorbing a lot of seawater because our, our diesel had somehow gotten a lot of seawater into it because it was rocking so heavily, the breathing valves started sipping in seawater and it was so cold, the seawater was crystallizing in the diesel and it was destroying our injectors. And we started with 12 injectors and by the time we were in that storm, we were down to half of those. And the wind is so intense that if you have to keep the boat pointed into the waves with the engine, and you can't have the sails up or it would just rip the mast down. Mm. If the engine were to die, you'll turn to the side and you'll capsize and that's kind of the end of you. And there could be an iceberg under every single heave. So, you know, we were just mm. hanging on by a thread and every two or three hours we'd have to turn the engine off and filter the fuel that was going in to save the injectors and then hope the engine turned back on. And there were a couple of times when there would be a, like a 20 minute period without an engine and we would drift with the waves and you could hear waves crashing on a shore and we're in the middle of the ocean and you, you, you know that that's an iceberg that's getting closer and closer. And we got really close to some massive icebergs. And yeah, but it, at the same time, it's not fear. It's just you slowly get into that situation and you're in such awe of it all. And you're just so overwhelmed that it's kind of a giddy smiling laughing in the face of it thing that happens we are i think it's some kind of unconscious thing that our bodies are wired to protect us because fear doesn't do anything at that point and you're just you know i don't know you just sort of accept it so oddly enough nobody was really afraid but it was terrifying <laughs> in the same moment you described at the start of the film antarctica being one of those places that really hasn't hit the tourism trap the tourism route I guess I'll call it. You guys, as you say, got to Antarctica and then you actually stood on a Antarctica. Now, as you mentioned at the start of the film, it's a bit dubious as to whether you were allowed to do that or not. But what was it like there in the short time you had on, on the continent? Yeah, I'd say that, yeah, Every, everywhere. Else, I mean, we've, I've traveled about 30,000 nautical miles on infinity at this point, And 
been throughout the entire Pacific Ocean almost. Um, and there are very few places left that are untouched by the horde of beaten down path tourism. Um, even Antarctica, right below South America, is now a tourist hotspot because you can go from Ushuaia down to Antarctica in the best weather in like four days and see a really beautiful peninsula. But the part we went below New Zealand in the middle is is mm. very hard to reach. And thankfully that it'll be it'll stay that way for a while just because of the extreme distance and the extreme risk. Um, and yes, and you have to get, it's, I wouldn't say dubious, we, did, we went not legally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're required to get permits to go there and you're required to take a guide. So they are making it, it's become out of reach of normal people. Um, you know, paying for a guide to come on your boat is thousands and thousands of dollars. And you can uh, argue that definitely it does, um, it's, it's a fragile ecosystem and it needs to be protected and having just anybody go down there isn't great, but it's also, you know, is this something that should just be for the wealthy in the world? Um, I don't know. Um, we ended up paying a fine for going down there. So we were caught. <laughs> so who <laughs> finds you? Who's responsible for that? The Antarctic Treaty Organization um, tasks its members for fining their citizens. So German, the boat is the vessels registered in Germany and the German government uh, fined us for going down there. And, you know, maybe that is the right thing. Uh, the fine, I will say, was significantly less than the cost of a guide. So we kind of operate under the assumption that perhaps maybe it's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission in some cases. And I'm not going to say what we did was, was totally right, but um, I don't believe that the the seventh continent should only be the purview of the ultra wealthy. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah. Um, but we did get on land for four months of sailing. We were on land for five hours and then uh, a massive storm hit, but we got to visit the uh, Adairi Peninsula, which is just absolutely breathtaking. And it's the oldest home of the oldest uh, cabin, the oldest permanent structure in Antarctica where, uh, the first overwintering happened where they kind of tested out what it would be like to overwinter. And they picked one of the most inhospitable parts of the entire continent to do that. They, so they put this cabin on this like cliff against a wall out in the ocean. And these guys just must've been out there for six months of darkness with nowhere to walk or roam. Or, I mean, it was, it's just a, it's a, it's a breathtaking place. But it's not a completely untouched part of the world. And one of the exciting parts of the film, but also worrying from an environmental point of view, in that the fishing grounds in Antarctica are far from being untouched, right? Maybe you could tell us more about the encounter with the Sea Shepherd organization, their boat, the Steve Irwin. Been a big uh, Sea Shepherd fan for a long time, and I think most, a lot of people on the boat are. Some of the Sea Shepherd crew uh, we've met over the years and they've come on our ship. Um, and, you know, I guess when we headed down there, we had seen that whale wars show and we're aware that the sea shepherd was kind of battling Japanese whalers in the Arctic. And we hoped that maybe we'd get a glimpse of it, but we didn't really expect that, you know, we didn't really expect to see them. Antarctica is massive and mm -hmm. nobody knows where anybody is. And so, yeah, after that, we were, after our five hours on land, we were, um, kind of figuring what next to do and it was the nighttime and uh, and then we just these guys came on the back of the boat in the middle of the night dressed in like dark ninja military fatigues wetsuits dry suits with uh, on their blacked out zodiac boat and it was just what like, did you Whoa. think when that happened <laughs> we thought that we thought it was uh, some sort of Antarctica Coast Guard that yeah. was gonna bust us <laughs> we thought I know the military the US uh, basic McMurdo was the closest thing. And we thought maybe somebody had come from McMurdo wondering what we were doing. Um, but to see that it was Sea Shepherd was just like, so awesome. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they were trying to escape uh, this, uh, the way it works down there is the Japanese have a, a giant mothership and then a bunch of harpoon boats. And they, 
Sea Shepherd tries to stop the offloading of whales from the harpoon boats onto the mothership. So they need to know where the mothership is at all times and they kind of try to disrupt that. And as long as they disrupt that, the harpoon boats can't go out and get more whales because they can't offload them. But the Japanese, um, they're using military satellite technology and stuff like that. So they can kind of keep track of the three or four uh, Sea Shepherd vessels and always keep the mothership away. And to make sure they really keep a track on it, they place a couple of harpoon boats on each. They keep a, a harpoon boat on each of the Sea Shepherd vessels so they know where it is. And so Sea Shepherd spends most of its time just trying to get away from these harpoon boats so they can then find the mothership and then harass it. And they were just, they can't get away from them very easily because they're way better equipped, way faster. And so the, the plan they found us in the middle of the night was that we would take the spot, the place, we were about the same size, we would take the place of the, um, of the Steve Irwin Sea Shepherd's vessel on radar. And that would allow the, uh, the Steve Irwin to pretend like it was an iceberg for a little while until we had just chased, we'd gone away and, and dragged and taken the, that vessel away. And then they would go out there and, and find the mothership. A game um, of cat and mouse on the high seas. Yes. And for us, though, that was pretty hard because we have no lights. <laughs> so steaming at full speed in Antarctica with the icebergs and everything is just so dangerous. And and so, but Captain Clem will do anything for the environment. And so it was not even a question of if he'd do it, it was just like, okay, when do we do it? And we just mad dashed out into the ice and you're just, you know, we have to have a spotter in the front of the boat, just peering out, just hoping they can see like a shine on the piece of ice and, and, uh, and it worked for a while. Yeah, it did work for a while. Yeah, shouting starboard or I forget there's a part of the film where you can see the stress level as you're traveling through the ice and Clem is shouting to someone at the front of the boat to speak up. I think it yeah. was an American mumbo jumbo or, or something yeah. along those lines. Was that you? Uh, that was, that was, yeah, I was trying to tell him where to go and he, he didn't like my accent. No, I'm on none <laughs> of this American mumbo jumbo. Um, he wanted, yeah, it's, it's hard to communicate effectively and there's a lag and, and infinity is a massive ship. So, turning her she doesn't respond all that fast so you really need to know ahead of time what's coming up and um and ice ice is incredibly dense i think one meter by square is 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 a like two metric tons or something it's just insane so if you hit that i mean it just it's like hitting a floating piece of granite and we're going you know 10 knots and you're on a 200 ton you know close to 200 ton vessel it's <laughs> it's epically bad I've seen the movie Titanic, Nico. I know what happens next. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we didn't have any watertight bulkheads. All of our bulkheads were dripping and leaking. And the bulkheads are the things that separates the boat off. So if one part gets crashed in, the rest of the boat doesn't sink. But... Oh, okay. I want to pick you up on preparation. There's one thing I can't overlook. As someone who prepares for outdoor trips quite religiously and we'll have a plan of what I want to bring two months before. I was staggered to hear that you had forgotten a sleeping bag. Yes. Yeah. I, um, I, I sort of play, I sort of thought the heater would work. And, um, and then I just kind of, I was thinking so much about filming and all the equipment that I would need and, and filming was so hard down there. I had to keep all my batteries in my underwear to keep them warm enough so that they could charge. And, and it's just the, the salt water, everything. So there's a million things to think about. And I just sort of didn't think about like my own comfort. And so I had, uh, I had to use all that. When pe some people come to infinity, they bring the airline blanket that they took the airline to get to us. And so right. we have a stash of pilfered airline blankets and a Snuggie. And that's what I used. And I just slept in all my clothing and I didn't, you know, We'd, I didn't shower for three months, four months. I didn't take my clothing off for three or four months. So I slept in my clothing and, and then six or seven airline blankets and the layers and, and it's damp in there and there's nothing. There's, every time you take a breath, the condensation just builds up around you and it can't escape. So it was like a damp, cold, rocking cave. It's kind of the, one of the most uncomfortable <laughs> experiences like one could ever imagine. What's it like taking off your clothes after four months at sea? 
I, yeah. I enjoy just taking my trousers off after a, a day outside at work. It must be it quite was, a feeling. It was horrific, actually. It was uh, the, my long johns were black when I um, left New Zealand. And then when I got to Chile, I got a hotel room so I could like thoroughly clean myself for the first time. And the long johns were gray from just all the dead skin cells inside. And I had to kind of scrape my skin with a knife to get a lot of it off. It was, I took seven or eight showers and they ran brown for like four or five of them. <laughs> it, was, it was one of the more disgusting experiences in life. But it's so cold on the boat, you don't smell each other. Like um, yeah. the cold particles just fall. I mean, the, the smell particles just fall in the cold. So it doesn't bother you then, but when you get to land and you look at yourself in the mirror and it's it's kind of yeah it's intense when you land at port and everyone's trying to get away from you you realize something's not quite right yeah and we just barely got into port we were down to the last two injectors cuz getting through the, we had to go go through a couple hundred miles of patagonian fjords and you can't sail through those so we were down to the last two injectors and infinity was going against the current it was just barely limping in and when we got into port, we actually had to attach our outboard engine for our little dinghy onto the back of Infinity and gas it full on because all the injectors were, were done. And that's what got us into our last anchorage. And try moving a you know 160-ton boat with a 40-horsepower Evinrude outboard is, I mean, you're just barely inching along. Yeah, I can't fathom it. Even a rowing boat for me is quite enough. And you mentioned at the end of the film that it wouldn't be your last expedition or journey on Infinity. And the film was shot back in 2014, right? Correct. Yeah. What have you been up to since then? Have you made it back onto the Infinity? Yeah. A life at sea is extremely addictive. And I think people try to carry it on as long as they possibly can because nothing else will give you the highs or the lows. Um, of that lifestyle. And the second I got off, I, I, I started working on finishing the film and because I edited, edited it, colored it, I mean, kind of did absolutely everything myself. And it took a really long time. Mm-hmm. Um, it took three years to get the film out. And wow. I was kind of obsessive about music. I licensed like 30 or 40 really great tracks from amazing bands. And I didn't know that it wasn't a thing you did for documentaries because that's the biggest part of my budget by far. And most people just have a, you know, a junky little custom track made or pick like temp music, you know, just music they get for free. And sure. um, so I just kind of obsessed and I was like seven days a week for two years. I just made that thing. Um, and that kept me from getting back at sea for a long time. Um, but the goal was always to use that as kind of a pitch vehicle to try to, to get a show made because it's amazing experience out there. I, I really think that, you know, People would love to see that kind of stuff, especially from the warmth of their couches, wrapped in blankets, not having to actually experience the daily misery of it all (laughs) um, with some really amazing people and like genuine human beings like themselves doing things that they're not supposed to and shouldn't be doing. Um, And so uh, the plan was always to try to get back out there. And we wanted to do the Northwest Passage, which is the most dangerous maritime route in the world, kind of the, the Everest for sailors. We definitely yeah, worked very hard to get up there, and we we did the trip. Uh, uh, we started it in Fiji in 2017. Uh, we were not able to raise any money to do it, so we did it again, just on a hope and a prayer, and kind of beg, borrowed, and um, got a, got some people to donate some time and money, and and we're just kind of barely able to uh, get our butts up there. And that is we um, that is the series that is on Discovery Channel right now called uh, Expedition to the Edge. Well, Nico, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. And also I should thank you for not only giving up a sleeping bag in place of all the filming equipment, but also dedicating two years of your life to making the film Sea Gypsies. Thank you, thank you very much. Nico's right. There's something about life in the ocean that just draws you in. If this conversation has put the wind in your sails about taking to the ocean, check out seagypsies.com to find out more about the movie, where to watch it, and perhaps how you too can get on board an infinity voyage. Catch you soon for the next adventure. Bye.